Okay, welcome everybody to the 2024 Just Markets webcast. Here we are in the last year of the first quarter century of the 20 of the uh, 2020 uh, 2000s here. So we can see we have Mick Jagger on the uh, cover page here, and the title is Just Markets is uh, too much to say. There's a lot of slides here, so I don't have a lot of uh, clever graphics, although I do have a few things that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, let's get started by looking at the year just passed, 2023. And we can see that outside of the commodity complex and the currency complex, things ended up all positive. With, uh, the S&P 500 up 26, virtually identical to Euro stocks, which in dollar terms are up 27. So about the same performance. Uh, Japan had a good year, uh, the Nikkei up 22%. So we've got double digit returns and of course the NASDAQ up almost 45%. Against all odds as the year was sh shaping up in 2023, we had a very strong bond rally in the last two months of the year. So we ended up actually with uh, more than the yield on the, bar on the Bloomberg Barclays Aggregate Index. Treasuries uh, did 4.1. The two year treasury did 3.5 for a long time. It was the lead performer as rates were rising uh, during mo much of the year until the last couple of months. We see the 10-year Treasury underperformed the two-year with 2.8, but the big winners were in the credit market where we see investment grade corporate bonds uh, up 8.5%, so outperforming Treasuries by 440 basis points. We see uh, agency uh, mortgage-backed securities, US MBS, up 5%. So underperformed corporates by 350 basis points. But the big winners were in the investment grade in the high yield bond market, where we see that the high yield uh, index was up 13.4, uh, almost identical to bank loans. Bank loans were way ahead, but the rally again in the last two months uh, led to a, a matching from the uh, high yield bond market. We also see uh, the dollar ended up down on the year. Uh, it was kind of volatile through the year, but it closed negative. And uh, we see that uh, the commodity that did well was gold and copper also uh, did about 2%. So let's get started. Here we have uh, Keith Richards and this section is titled Rough Enough. I'm using the song Beast of Burn, one of my favorite Rolling Stone songs uh, where he says, am I rough enough? Am I tough enough? Am I rich enough? And we'll get to that. So Keith Richards remarked that he sort of shocked that he lives, is still alive after the rough life that he lived, but his face sure shows it, but fantastic, fantastic musician and guitar player and songwriter. All right, so what's rough? What's rough is the recession indicators look a little rough. We see the yield curve, uh, the red shaded areas, as always, are recessionary periods. This goes back to 1980. And we see that the yield curve inverts and it gets a lot of attention in financial media. Usually you see white papers about why it doesn't matter this time. And uh, we've been inverted for about that length of time that usually precedes recessions. And then we see the uh, red shaded area starts to shrink. That means the yield curve starts to de-invert. I saw a question in the queue. I've gone through the questions. I'm gonna answer them, uh, some of them anyway, through the course of this uh, 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 pod webcast. So we say that we've had the yield curve de-inverting. I do think it matters. Uh, and it's been de-inverting for long enough that it sort of looks like uh, kind of that period back at the beginning on the left-hand side of the chart. So this is showing kind of a high probability of recession coming, I would say, here in 2024. The next slide, we look at the leading economic indicators. And this is six months annualized and year over year. And uh, we've been at this low number of about negative 7% in both the six month uh, annualized and the year over year for a while now, really the better part of a year even more than a year perhaps. And uh, we see that typically we uh, start to see the, the recession show up. This hasn't worked so well this time. And the reason I think is the leading indicators have a lot of manufacturing in it. And manufacturing uh, indicators got weak, uh, very weak uh, a couple of years ago. And then services got strong uh, to uh, sort of offset the manufacturing weakness. And so we've had kind of a baton pass from manufacturing to services. And uh, that continues to sort of be the case. So I think the couple of things that have gone wrong with economic analysis for the past two or three years is this manufacturing to services handoff. But in addition, there was so much uh, monetary stimulus that skewed just about everything. And so people that looked at M2, 
and said, notice that a year ago it had gone negative on year-over-year -year basis. A lot of monetary economists predicted recession in 2023, and it didn't show up because while the money supply was shrinking somewhat on a year-over-year -year basis, there was still so much money around from all the tremendous stimulus of 2020, 2021. Trying to get to the next slide here. Bear with me. Okay, there we go. Now, this is one that we like to use. This is the backup in the unemployment rate. And this goes back to 1949, so basically post-World War II. And you can see that there's that 0.5 horizontal line that's in kind of a tan color. And you'll notice historically that when you get uh, above 0.5, with very rare exceptions, you go get, get to a recession very, very quickly. The red dotted line on the right-hand side of the display is the Bloomberg forecast, the median forecast for where the unemployment rate is going. And you'll notice that it does indeed predict that we're going to go above that 0.5 number. Here it shows that it would go up to about 0.75 or so. But you'll notice that's not a lot of historical precedent for it only going that high. Typically, when you get into a red shaded area of recession, you get the unemployment rate that goes up uh, pretty substantially, more than half a percent, more than one percent in virtually all cases. And I would expect that that would happen again if we get into a recession this year. I think the unemployment rate uh, will, per usual, uh, go sort of vertical. And I think that's because once you start getting layoffs, you sort of have a an environment where it's okay to lay people off. I noticed that a large money management firm today announced they're laying off about 3% of their workforce to uh, you know, kind of right size the various growing areas of the businesses that need more resources. And so when, once you start to see that happening, I, I think there's cover for entities to let people go. I noticed that with the um, minimum wage increases that I think it's a Pizza Hut or another pizza chain has laid off thousands of delivery people. And of course, once you get uh, these uh, autonomous, these robots that deliver these uh, restaurant things, uh, you won't need any of these delivery people. I've seen them rolling around Santa Monica already here in Southern California, these little uh, boxes on wheels. It's kind of uh, right out of a sci-fi movie, it seems. So here's how the unemployment rate tends to move uh, going into recession. So the vertical red line is the start of the official recessions. And we have on the left-hand side, starting 24 months before, and we monitor the unemployment rate. And the black line is the median of the recession since 1949. And the blue shaded area is the two middle quartiles. So it's the 25 to 75%. And then we've plotted out where we are right now, and we've just made it the best fit to that median line. And I'll be darned if the best fit doesn't sort of suggest recession is uh, coming soon using this one indicator. So you'll also, just another proof statement, you'll notice that when the unemployment rate starts to go up, it goes up uh, on an accelerating basis. Here we have the unemployment rate versus its 12-month moving average, and it's basically right on top of its 12-month moving average now. And usually when it crosses the 12-month moving average, you're getting close to recession. And uh, again, once the unemployment rate starts to go up, it can go up pretty quickly and pretty dramatically, at least it did during the global financial crisis, uh, not quite as severely during the dot-com aftermath of the bust, but obviously the COVID situation is very, very different and has distorted a bunch of economic data. And it's made, it's made uh, indicators less reliable, I would say, uh, over the last three to three years uh, than they would typically have been. But I think that's starting to fade into the background now as we don't have all of this uh, tremendous amount of money printing that's, that's been going on. The one indicator that has not tripped for unemployment is the unemployment rate versus 36 month moving average. And we see that in the last two recessions, it crossed above its three-year moving average exactly at the doorstep of a recession. We're still distorted here by uh, three years ago, the unemployment rate was so high, but that's starting to roll off. And so we're going to start to see the unemployment rate go above its 36-month moving average with a pretty decent likelihood somewhere in the first quarter or certainly the first half of this new year of 2024. So this is something we're gonna to have to watch out for. This is a very interesting uh, uh, parsing of unemployment. Again, with the red shade areas of recessions, there's two types of unemployment that we're tracking at this display. One is so-called cyclical unemployment, and then there's the non-cyclical unemployment. 
So you'll notice that there's a huge divergence right now between the yellow line, non-cyclical, and the blue line, which has now fallen below zero. So the um, uh, unemployment is, is actually growing. The employment is shrinking in the cyclical side. And last time we had a recession in the global financial crisis, you'll see it looked kind of where how it looks today. And again, in the dot-com situation, these divergences tend to be precursors to recession. So I do think that the labor market is the last one to go typically, and it looks like it's starting to loosen up a little bit, but we have not seen a, a real surge in unemployment yet anyway. But interesting, this is getting a lot of play uh, recently because it's so unusual, and this is payroll revisions. So they revise the uh, payrolls from time to time, and the most recent revision was pretty huge. It's almost revised down from pre previous reports by nearly uh, 500,000 uh, jobs. And I, I noticed that there seems to be a pattern developing that we get the unemployment release, the employment data every Friday, first Friday of every month. And the numbers have been coming out pretty good, but weirdly they seem to be re revised lower much more often than not. And it seems like we get high employment first reads and then we get a revision that's quite a bit lower. A conspiracy theorist, which I'm really not one, but a conspiracy theorist would might say that they're doing that on purpose, that they're uh, boosting the real-time number, the first look at employment data, so that they can tout that the uh, employment uh, economy is still really good, and then it gets revised lower. It could be something sinister about it. This is a fairly uh, substantial uh, downward revision in, in the most uh, recent data point. Also of concern, the Philadelphia Fed Coincident Index, this is what number of states, the count of states that have a negative monthly change in the Philly Fed economic, you know, cons coincident economic index. And we're, we're up to 30 out of 50, which uh, I, they might have uh, D DC on here as well. So it might be 51, but you'll say that we're really elevated here. And it, this type of impulse higher has really never happened before without a recession. So this is another thing that looks kind of rough in the economic data. Okay, so now let's go into Tough Enough, the second line from the uh, sort of the, the, the chorus of Beast of Burden. And here's the great drummer, Charlie Watts, who passed away a couple of years ago. And Charlie Watts was an incredibly good drummer, a very simplistic drummer. You can listen on the internet to tracks that isolate just his drumming, and it's shockingly simplistic because it's so effective. The other thing that's really amazing about Charlie Watts is he didn't really lead the rhythm section of the band. It was Keith Richards that led the rhythm, rhythm section. And what I mean by that is Charlie Watts always played a, a fraction of a beat below the tempo that was created by Keith Richards. And it creates the unique Rolling Stones sound that's almost impossible to replicate because it's very, very hard to do what Charlie Watts was able to do. I play drums professionally uh, for quite a while. And so I, I know how hard it is what he did, even though it looks easy. It's just like it's just like a Mondrian painting. It's very, very hard to do to make it look so elegant, but people say it's so easy, anybody could do it. Uh, no, you couldn't. All right, so what's, what's tough? What's tough is our budget situation. I talked at this at length uh, at, at the Total Return webcast, which was back in December, but something really strange has happened here. And that is that you'll notice that we have a, a dotted line on here, and that's the unemployment rate. And then we've got the shaded area of the budget deficit, which is shown uh, inverted, which means when the red shaded area is going up, that's the budget deficit going up. Uh, and, and so as a percentage of GDP. Now you'll notice that from 1970 until around 2015, these lines were highly correlated, the shaded area and the dotted line. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Because when you have a recession, you're going to have unemployment going up and you're going to have tax receipts going down. And so in recessions, the budget deficit should go up. And when unemployment's low and the economy's good, the budget deficit should be going down. But you'll notice since 2015, that isn't happening anymore. What's happening is that even though unemployment is low down at that 3.7 area, obviously there was a big gyration with the lockdown of the economy, but taking that out, it's been down at about 3.7 for the better part of five years, and yet the budget deficit isn't going down. In fact, it's higher than it was in 2015 when unemployment was a lot higher. And this is sort of causing a pretty big problem uh, 
because interest rates aren't at zero anymore. When interest rates are at zero, you can borrow an infinite amount of money. And uh, until you have a maturity date, you don't have anything to worry about. You don't have any interest payments to make. And I suppose if interest rates were still at zero when the maturities came, you could just roll it over again at zero. But this is causing real stress to our economic system that is going to be a major issue. I think it's already becoming a major issue, but over the course of 2024, particularly if a recession shows up. Because here we are as the federal interest expense as a percentage of federal tax revenue. And you can see that back in the 80s, we were up at about 18% uh, interest expenses percent of revenue. That's because interest rates were so high during the early 80s, and they filtered through the system uh, all the way through the, the, the 80s into the early 90s. And there were some budget deficits then too. So now we have seen interest rates going up with the Fed raising interest rates up by five and a quarter percent or so. We see that you don't have zero interest rates anymore. You have 4%. We even had 5% interest rates back in October. And we haven't even seen those interest rates really fully filter through the system. So we're already up at 15% of tax revenue um, as, a, as the interest expenses percent of tax revenue. And this is going to be an increasing problem because the deficit isn't going away. And the interest rates have been stabilized at about 4% or so. We'll have to see what happens if the Fed's going to cut rates. Uh, it sort of feels like they're going to. Uh, they're, they're even sort of predicting it a little bit. And so uh, we'll see. Maybe they're doing this. Maybe they did the big pivot back uh, in early November because they realized that interest rates at 5.5% filtering through the system are really unaffordable. And as much as people say rates are, are too low right now, I think the Fed is going to be very careful to not have very high real interest rates because they, they know the arithmetic of this uh, higher interest rate filtering through into the rolling off stock of debt. $17 trillion of treasuries roll off in the next 36 months. And those, that's about half of the, of, the, of the national debt. And those bonds, a lot of them have interest rates that are at 1% or lower. Uh, the five years that were issued, you know, uh, five years ago were at interest rates of around, you know, 50 basis points. And those would be rolled up, would be re uh, issued at around 4% or so. And the Fed is doing quantitative tightening. So I don't think that they're about to turn around and do quantitative easing uh, on a dime. This is the CBO's projection of where federal interest rate expense will be as a percentage of tax revenue. And obviously the red area is their projection and it's going up. They predict that in five years, it'll be somewhere close to 20% of uh, the tax revenue. I don't think that's right. I think that's, I think that's too low because this estimate dis assumes there will never be a recession. That's the, their framework. They also use interest rates uh, uh, in the future that are assumed to be a little bit lower than they are even today. And they assume a budget deficit, which is lower than our budget deficit is right now. And the economy appears to be weakening and could be headed for recession. And so this uh, rendezvous with 20% interest costs uh, as a percentage of tax revenue could be much sooner than 2030 or 2032. I, I think it could be uh, next year, maybe not 2024, but I think it would be 2025. And so this is really, uh, this is really very tough. Here's the size of the U.S. debt markets. You'll notice that the lower areas, um, open market paper and munis, have been stable for a number of years. Uh, but agency securities and treasury securities have really shot higher, particularly the gold area. Those are the treasury securities. And obviously, this trend seems to be very firmly in place. With This is, this is not the national debt over on the y-axis. This is just the publicly held uh, the, pub the publicly owned bonds, so it's only at about 29 trillion, even though the national debt crossed 34 trillion dollars uh, the third day here in 2024. Here's the interest on the national debt. Uh, the upper uh, part of the display is just in in dollars. So we're at a billion a, tr a trillion dollars in interest expense now. That's up from about 508 billion dollars just five years ago. so it's doubled. And the trajectory here is very alarming. And so the interest expense of percentage of GDP, this is not versus tax revenues, versus GDP, is going basically straight vertical. So we're going to have a problem here. And the problem is going to be that this, these lines will all get much worse should a recession occur 
uh, well, wh when the next rece recession occurs, it may not be this year. I think it will be this year, but uh, that is going to mean that we're going to have an exploding problem with this debt. And I, I just believe we're going to have to go to extraordinary uh, tools that we've used in the past, like inflationary policies, like monetizing debt, or, or else uh, artificially low interest rates, as we did. We might go back to quantitative easing, for example, uh, to help deal with this problem. That would ultimately push the problem a little bit farther into the future. But this is not our grandchildren's problem. It's not our children's problem. It's our problem. And uh, we've seen that Medicare is projected to go bankrupt in eight years by their own trustees, and Social Security in 10 years uh, will be broke in 10 years. Of course, those assume no recession. And obviously, there'll be a recession in the next eight to 10 years. And so they're going to go broke a lot sooner than that. These problems are going to be have, have to be dealt with, and they're very tough problems. All right, the average interest rate is rising. Uh, we had an average interest rate on interest-bearing treasuries of 1.4 two, two short years ago, and now it's up to 3.2. This, of course, is a force multiplier on the interest expense problem. Uh, right now, 3.17 is the average. Well, uh, interest rates are between about four and five and a half today. Uh, the, the five and a half is at the very short end. The fours are pretty much out two years and out, uh, roughly, four uh, percent. But that's higher than 3.17. So the, we still are running a two trillion dollar budget deficit, and we are still rolling over uh, all of our national debt at ever increasing interest rates. The, that probably has some. Uh, role to play in the Fed doing their pivot. So let's look at what might happen in a recession. Um, here we see, going back to 1969, that the average increase in the budget deficit during recessions is 5.2. In the early recessions before 1990, it was more like a three handle on average or a two and a half type percent on average. But over the fullness of this uh, multi-decade period, what we see is the average is 5.2. Of course, in the last 24 years, we've had three recessions, and it's averaged 9.4, the increase in the budget deficit. Now, that's obviously being elevated by the March 2020 brief COVID lockdown situation. But if you just look at the global financial crisis, it was 8.6. So I, don't, I, th I think it's plausible that the budget deficit could increase by around 8.6 or 9% or so in the next recession. Let's see what that would mean. So here's uh, where we're looking at the budget deficit with CBO projections, and then we're throwing on these histories. So on the left-hand side, we're using the full, uh, the, the full multi-decade back to 1969 increase in the deficit. What that would mean is that the deficit would go up to $3 trillion pretty quickly. Uh, and headed to more like three and a half trillion dollars if we stayed at that level of uh, budget deficit. But then we say if we use the most recent three recessions on average, that 9.4, we'd be running more like four trillion dollars uh, to almost five trillion dollars. Five trillion dollars would be about 20 percent of today's GDP. So uh, this is very, very uh, tough. So let's just take a quick uh, snapshot of the Fed. They're doing quantitative tightening. We saw the reversal back in March of last year when the regional banks had problems, and they've been on autopilot since then. They've been true to their word, they've been doing quantitative tightening, and uh, we're still up at about $7.7 .7 trillion or so on the Fed's balance sheet, but it's headed down uh, you know, on, this, on this trajectory. Uh, I believe in the next recession, this trajectory will be reversed again, and we'll have to go back to quantitative easing to deal with these problems. That would probably be an inflationary problem. So my, my bottom line on all of this, thinking about it, is, is I think we're going to have an inflationary response to the next economic weakness period. And I think it's going to be an inflationary situation. And it's going to cause a lot of angst and a lot of uh, inflationary policy, I think, is what we're going to run. And so in the next recession, I think interest rates are not going to fall precipitously. I think they've already fallen in a way that surprised a lot of people. I talked about this on national TV at the uh, November Fed meeting that we were starting a bond rally. And I think the bond rally can continue somewhat from these levels. I would expect bonds could perhaps on the 10 year go down to about 3.3 or so uh, as the, if the economy weakens. But then I think people will be surprised that they won't be able to hold at those levels because of inflationary policy. I've talked about this for a few years now that all that we think we know about the way the economy works and interest rate work has been informed by falling interest rates 
for about four decades, but that has stopped. Interest rates have, I think, pretty clearly bottomed uh, with the, the uh, long bond went all the way down to 1%. I think intraday it even got to 70 basis points during the absolute panic of the, of the COVID. But I don't think we're gonna see that again. In fact, we might see rising interest rates in the uh, aftermath of the next recession based upon the inflationary policies. So I, I'm thinking that, you know, enjoy the bond rally. It's been, it's been good for the past couple of months, but um, we're starting to think that you need to be uh, thinking outside of the box. Uh, not yet because the recession isn't here yet and we haven't had, uh, at least it's not officially here yet. And we obviously haven't seen any sort of panic policies in response to a recession that isn't uh, identified as being here yet. But I think that's going to happen. Now, we're talking a lot about the problems with taxes and problems with the deficit. Um, one thing that's interesting is these are the largest endowments. I think these are like the 15 largest endowments at universities. And Harvard, much in the news, is 50, 50 uh, billion, Yale, 40 plus billion, and so forth. Well, why can't these foundations, uh, well, these endowments pay their fair share? I mean, if they're if Harvard uh, just to pick the the biggest one, um, if, if they make a return of, of I don't know eight percent on average, that's four billion dollars. At least that'd be one way of uh, if we tax some of that would be one way of uh, putting at least a small dent in our budget deficit problem. Rich enough, I got Mick Jagger on here again with that uh, classic uh, inimitable smile, and uh, I've, that's rich enough. I think Mick Jagger's rich enough. But what's rich enough also are certain parts of the financial markets. And rich enough for sure is the uh, S&P 500 is rich enough. We've retraced all the way back up to a double top basically at where we were in late 2021 or the very first part of 2022. I think the uh, S&P topped out back there at, uh, I think it was on January 4th of 2022. So here we are almost exactly two years later we're basically at the same place. Um, I think that uh, this looks like a, a pretty lousy trade location to own stocks. I talked about how it was a good good location on national TV on Fed Day back in November, but this looks like a pretty bad trade location at now with a double top going on. 2023 uh, did not have much earnings growth. It was 1%. That's that green line. This goes back about 10 years or so, and we're just saying, what, what is, what's the forecast on what earnings going to be in terms of growth and what it turned out to be? And with the exception of 2018 and 2021, it's basically always over-promised and under-delivered, particularly in 2023. Uh, back in 2021, when they started doing the guessing, it was going to be 10%, very often 10% when the first guess is made two years in advance. But obviously, it kind of cratered down to 1%. Now, of course, they're expecting for both 2024 and 2025, guess what, 11 12%, that same number. I, I think if you don't get that uh, 11% in 2024, and I, my suspicion is we're not going to get it because the pattern here and because I think the economy has better than 50% chance of hitting a recession this year, I actually say it's more like probably 75% chance of, of running into a recession, uh, you're, you're, it's going to be hard to sustain that double top in the S&P 500 with this type of expectations of earning growth, perhaps under delivering, which has been the norm. Also, we see a double top in the market cap S&P, and if you calculate the equal weighted S&P, which there are, there are uh, functions that do this, you'll notice that we're right back where we were in 2020 with, a, with the uh, lack of breadth. Uh, it's gotten a little bit better. You'll notice that the red line has come down. That means the equal weighted has been outperforming very recently. But this looks like a pretty big reversal to me. So one of the questions in the queue was, would I favor equal weighted to market cap weighted? And I certainly have been favoring equal weighted really for the past several months, it looks to me like this line should be going lower. So we'd be looking for a little bit uh, underperformance of the high flyers, the so-called Magnificent Seven and their ilk. Here's growth versus value. And obviously growth has done really well uh, for really all 20 years, basically. Growth has tremendously outperformed value, but that stopped a couple of years ago. And we've seen, uh, we've, we've seen uh, that, that reversal, although not during 2023. We saw that for much of the year, we saw the growth outperforming value that has reversed yet again. I would stay with this trade. I would stay with the value over growth uh, at, at this juncture. Here's the Magnificent Seven. We see 
that the uh, there was a there was a, a a trend channel from the very beginning of 2023 all the way up into July, where the uh, Magnificent Seven were tremendously outperforming uh, the S and P 500 broadly. You see the ratio almost doubled, so they outperformed by like 100 percent. That stopped. Uh, it's gone dead sideways ever since July. And usually, in my experience, when you have these persistent trends that start to, to struggle and stall out, it means that a trend change is coming. Here's uh, another graphic of, of breadth. This is probably Goldman Sachs research. And it's just uh, what percentage of the S&P is below its 52-week uh, uh, high. Uh, so the lower the number here, the narrower the breadth. And it's gotten better in recent months, but it's still uh, relatively narrow. I pointed out at the beginning that the US uh, did not really outperform during 2023, and really that's been the case versus the rest of the world broadly for nearly two years, back to the top uh, in the turn of the year 2021 to 2022. This to me looks like it's reversing as well. We can't, we've lost the trend line that was drawn on here diagonally, and it looks again like this is stalling out. So I've been favoring non-US stocks, US stocks for a couple of years now. And as we saw on the first page of this uh, uh, webcast, uh, the, the rest of the world, uh, particularly Europe, did the same as the United States. Japan did almost as well. And so we're not really the world beater any longer. And that might have something to do with all of our mismanagement of our fiscal situation and uh, the crazy policies that we've been putting in place more, in more recent years. OK, here's this versus Europe. And uh, we actually invested in Europe way back in uh, 2020, and it really hasn't worked and it hasn't not worked. It's been basically the same uh, result with some volatility, obviously, on a, on a month by month basis, but it's performed basically in line with uh, Europe's about the same as the S&P 500. This is uh, the S&P versus the MSCI EM index. And we've got that plotted against the dollar. So the red line is the uh, S&P divided by the Emerging Market Index. And we see what looks like a very elevated valuation here by the S&P. That has been uh, correlated, not surprisingly, with the value of the uh, trade-weighted broad dollar. That's the blue line. I think that blue line is going to come down in the next recession, which means that the S&P 500 should underperform EM in the next recession. It looks to me like this blue line is losing losing uh, its momentum. And in fact, it seems to like it has no momentum. And based on this incredible run that's gone back for you know a couple of decades here, uh, there's plenty of room for this uh, trend to reverse. And I expect that will be the case, although I think it will take uh, a recession for the dollar to really break down hard. So the, finally, the last lyric of the verse is, uh, of the chorus rather, is not too blind to see. So we're going to talk about uh, yields and fixed income in some depth here. And uh, I think the conclusion I have is I'm not too blind to see where the value is. And I think this is going to be a, a, an active management type of a market. Let's just look at where we've come uh, during 2023. We've got the yield curve as of the end of 2022. That's the, the tan line. And we've got the yield curve at year end 2023. And it's really fascinating how the 10 year Treasury moved by all of one basis point. That's it. And I think that was my prediction last year that we'd have volatility uh, for rising rates and then falling rates, and that we'd end about where we started. I didn't really think it would be to the basis point. On the long bond, it's about the same story, although on the last day of the year, the long bond uh, went up a few basis points. And so it didn't end exactly where it started. But look at the, look at the short end. We were at uh, 533 at the end of 2023. That's up from 434, so 100 basis point rise. Kind of not surprisingly, given that the Fed continued to raise rates until uh, into uh, July of uh, last year. So how long has this inversion been going on? I showed that inversion chart in the, in the uh, rough enough section, uh, and, but th this puts it in context of going back to the late 70s, and we've been inverted for a long time. So the higher the triangle blue areas are, that's how it means you've been inverted for a long time. You have to go back to the late 70s. A lot of these charts look like are starting to look like the late 70s. Uh, 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 this inversion is as well. We've, we, this is through uh, January 5th, so we have 79 weeks of twos tens inversion. Uh, and so we're almost at the record in a couple of months. 
will have matched 1979. So we're getting long in the tooth on this curve being inverted, which increases the odds for recession just on a mathematical statistical basis. This is around the world now. We've got central banks um, of, of, we got the Fed, the ECB, we got the uh, BOJ, BOC, and everybody's expected to cut here in uh, the first eight months of 2024. The Fed is the black dotted line. Uh, they're projected not by the Fed to cut rates by 100 basis points, but by the market uh, by uh, September 1st. And that's pretty much the same in the ECB based upon market pricing and a little bit delayed, but still some cutting uh, by the uh, BOC and uh, the, uh, the uh, Bank of China. So I would say that ultimately the Fed follows the two-year treasury. And in fact, the ten -year, two-year treasury yield tends to lead the Fed. And this goes back to 1991. You'll notice that the generic two-year yield tends to pierce below the red Fed funds rate uh, before the Fed cuts. That's typical. It doesn't work every time, but it clearly works. It obviously worked uh, with the Fed hiking cycle. It worked with the 2018-2019 cutting cycle. Two-year obviously led in 2016 and so forth. And it, it, the two-year is clearly signaling that the Fed is going to cut rates. Two-year could be wrong. Something could change. But the base case, even by the Fed's own words, is the Fed's going to be cutting interest rates. The two-year seems to think the Fed's going to be cutting rates by a percent or more, which is a greater number of basis points than the Fed themselves has in their uh, dot plot. We do the same thing that we do with recessions. We do this with the last rate uh, hike by the Fed. So that vertical black line is the historical last cut, uh, last hike rather, of, of, the, of the Fed. And then we show the two-year yield. And you'll notice that the median, the black line, Again, the shaded area is the middle quartiles. What we see is that the two-year treasury nails it. I mean, the two-year treasury peaks out pretty much every time, or it's on average, on the median, uh, right, right at the time of the last Fed hike. And that's basically the case now. Sure, it went a little bit higher uh, after the uh, last hike by the Fed, but it didn't go very much higher. And then, of course, uh, it, no surprise, the two-year yield goes up leading into the last Fed rate hike, and then it falls after that. You'll notice that the median is the two-year Treasury falling by 300 basis points. I'm not sure that's going to happen this time, because this is all informed of that secular declining interest rate period. But certainly, one would expect the two-year Treasury would fall, and the yield curve should steepen. Let's look at the long-term trend of the 30-year US Treasury. Uh, we have a, a, a channel that's drawn, and that channel was very, very good uh, at containing the 30-year uh, Treasury yield, uh, we see that if you bought it when it was when it was uh, up at the top end of the channel, you made quite a bit of money pretty much every time, or even if it was in the the middle part of that uh, top area. Uh, and now we see that the we've blown totally out of that channel. Um, is it possible that we go back and touch that channel? Uh, I suppose anything's possible, uh, but I doubt we'll even make it down that far before the inflationary forces of in, of recession fighting. Uh, start, start to start to appear. So we say that we had a pretty big rally on the 30-year Treasury. You, you might think that uh, the 30-year Treasury didn't end up that badly, but but no. This is a, a an exhibit of the drawdown historically on 30-year Treasury. So when you start to go into rising rate periods, we have what's called a drawdown: the price drop from the the very highest price down to the lowest during the sell-off. And in spite of the fact that that we've had that rally shown on the previous exhibit, it still looks pretty bad. I mean, we were down at a loss, a drawdown of about 54%. But even with this big rally, we still have a drawdown of 46. That's because when you go down by 50%, you know, you, you need a big rally. When we're down 55%, you need about a 20% rally just to get up to where we are now. So we're still having very substantial losses on, uh, on 30 year treasuries that were bought back in 2019 and 2020. That could be an issue for the banking system uh, should uh, sh should this yield not uh, come down, because we saw with the regional banks, as the canaries in the coal mine, that the interest rate setup that we were enduring during the first part of 2022, uh, 2023 rather, uh, turned out to be so somewhat toxic for banks 
that uh, had locked in very, very low yields when the deposits all came in with the government money in 2020, 2021. So let's look at our old friend, the copper gold ratio. It was really ineffective for much of 2023, but it did uh, finally became sort of a uh, worthwhile indicator uh, later in the year where the big gap between the red line, which is the 10 year treasury yield and the ratio of the price of copper price of gold turned into really an alligator jaws situation, which has happened before. You'll notice there was that sort of a gap in prior periods, particularly in 2020, where uh, the copper gold ratio was screaming for higher bond yields. And they actually ended up converging the two lines back in the middle of 2022. And then it was sort of screaming for lower bond yields, the copper gold ratio during the last three quarters of 2023. And it didn't happen for about six months. And now it's sort of happening with yields falling and the copper gold ratio gently going up. One thing that's interesting is the correlation. It's not all that surprising, but I think the correlation is higher than most people's intuition would tell them, at least directionally. The levels obviously don't line up, but the direction of, uh, of the um, generic 10-year yield and the front month WTI contract is pretty good, it's particularly over the past eight years, where they're directionally almost identical. And of course, yields have come down the past two months and not all that uh, surprising, given this graphic that we've seen uh, crude oil prices dropping. Uh, crude oil prices dropping is another recessionary indicator, by the way, um, which means that there's probably lower uh, energy demand, which means lower industrial activity globally. There's the twos, tens, uh, and the Dixie inverted. And so the uh, red line is the dollar index, and that's uh, that, that's inverted. So the red line going up means the dollar is going down. And the twos tens curve uh, tends to follow the, that. So if the dollar is going to go down, we would expect the curve to steepen. Well, that makes a lot of sense. One of the reasons that uh, that the dollar has been help holding up better than maybe it should have is because we have a higher interest rate than many places in the world. And that has supported the dollar. But if the Fed's going to cut rates, if the, if the curve's going to de-invert, well, then we won't have uh, so much of a rate premium, perhaps, versus some other uh, countries, and that would mean the dollar would go down. Also, the curve de-inverting is highly suggestive of recession, and I think the dollar is going to have big problems in the next recession uh, in, uh, as a consequence of the policies that we've, we run to try to deal with what could be a very painful recession, as I, saw, as I showed in those deficits as a percentage of GDP charts earlier. So here's the dollar index. And uh, you'll notice that the dollar topped out at about 115 on the Dixie. And that was back in October of 2022. In fact, I talked about this in the Just Markets webcast a year ago, and the dollar's down about 10% from its high. One thing that is remarkable, uh, it's, it's almost a cliche, but it continues to work, is that magazine covers seem to always time markets per perfectly wrong. Here were two, uh, uh, magazine covers, I used this in my webcast a year ago, saying that I thought the dollar would go down in uh, 2023. And it did a little bit, but this this uh, forecast was made uh, in the first week or so of October of 2022 by Barron's, the powerful greenback. Um, basically, it, it's going higher is what they're saying. And then the one on the right is really laughable. It's Bloomberg Business Week, where it says, the Fed has turned the US dollar into a wrecking ball and there's no end in sight to the carnage. Of course, that was basically the week of the high of the dollar index. So watch out for those magazine covers uh, because they work remarkably well. They're, they're not perfect, but uh, they probably have a better hit rate than even I do on my forecast. I have about a 70% accurate hit rate. People like to say, oh, you got this wrong or that wrong. Sure, I get things wrong about 30% of the time. I think these magazines have even better hit rate than I do. I think they're, they get it wrong uh, probably more than 80% of the time. So watch out for those magazine covers. Um, this is uh, the dollar versus commodities. So not, not surprisingly, when the dollar uh, goes down, and again, the dollar is inverted here, so the red line going up means the dollar is going down. Not surprisingly, when the dollar goes down, commodities go up and vice versa. So I don't expect commodities go up initially because activity seems to be slowing. Uh, 
and that should be a damper for commodities. But if the dollar declines in the next recession, which I would expect, I think the move to make when recession hits is buy emerging market equities and buy commodity currencies and commodities. Um, I don't really have a strong uh, positive view on commodities in the near term because of recession, but I will take a look at what's been going on in the commodity index for long uh, or long term in a moment. Let's take a look at the inflation uh, perspective. I got a lot of charts on inflation here. There's uh, many different indices of inflation and they keep uh, rotating in terms of the focus that the market gives them. But the one that is really the starting point, and this comes out this week, is the CPI. So this is headline and core CPI. And the Fed was very late to raise rates when because the, the CPI got all the way up on the headline to 9.1 and it's fallen down to 3.1. It's probably gonna stay around this level for a couple, three months. And then we think, thanks to somewhat of a recessionary view, we think the CPI is gonna come down and go back down to what, what the Fed wants, somewhere in the two and a half or even lower range. Right now, the headline has stalled out in the low threes after declining by about 600 basis points. It's now going sideways, but the, the X food and energy uh, is lagging because it's of course sort of designed to be less high frequency and that's at four and that's probably still going to come down a little bit more. You don't hear about super core inflation anymore. That's what Jay Powell introduced, I think in September of 2022 as a new preferred me measure of inflation. He doesn't even talk about it anymore, but uh, it is behaving a little bit better in recent months. It had been stubborn above four that's the uh, the uh, super core CPI is the red line. I'm looking at, and then the in the PCE, which is the one that the Fed really uses. That's the blue line. That was stubborn uh, above four, even stubborn at five for a while. But now it has fallen rather dramatically over the past few months, and it's down at three and a half. I even though they don't talk about it, I suspect that they were encouraged by the acceleration down to three and a half, the deceleration down to three and a half, the pace of it, and that maybe gave them more courage to uh, kind of announce in, in, in sort of in code that the rate hikes are not really uh, gonna happen anymore. So another thing that no doubt factors into the decision are these six month annualized numbers. When I say there's a lot of inflation indices and they kind of rotate in terms of what the market focuses on, this is one that has become talked about a lot because it's been uh, so cooperative to what the Fed is trying to accomplish. And that is not taking year over year numbers, but taking six month numbers, the last six months and annualizing it. And so we see the PCE less food and energy that's on the right hand scale, that's at 1.9. That's even below the Fed's 2% if you annualize the six month number. And then you see the PCE chain price index at exactly 2.0% exactly on the Fed's target. So no wonder the Fed is feeling more relaxed about the need to raise interest rates and is even talking about, uh, well, some Fed officials are talking about cutting interest rates. So here we have a core CPI and PCE inflation. So we're gonna annualize the core numbers uh, for the last six months. And here we see the PCE, uh, less food and energy for the last six months is behaving exactly as the Fed would want. 1.9%, still a little wood to chop on the CPI, less food and energy, but uh, we think that the CPI on X food and energy and the CPI broadly will be falling into the two handle. Uh, certainly on the headline CPI by probably the middle of next year and, uh, and uh, the uh, core CPI uh, will, be, will be falling too. So why, do I, why am I so confident that the CPI is gonna be headed down? Well, it has a lot to do with the lag in shelter prices. And we've talked about this before. The CPI uses this shelter component, which lags actual price movements on both houses and rents. And there's a lot of uh, powerful data that proves that point, which I have not included here. But what we have is about a third of the CPI is shelter. Uh, and so the CPI shelter component is still at 6.7 for the last 12 months. But the core, the S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller Price Index is at 4%. So it's almost 300 basis points lower. So a th almost a third of the CPI is gonna fall by roughly 100 basis points with this lagged basis. And so that means that the CPI is going to come down, all things being equal because of the shelter component. Another thing is owner's equivalent rent. 
is coming down over 300 basis points. So that also fact filters through the CPI on a lagged basis. As you can see, the red line, which is the Zillow rent index, is, is significantly correlated to the, uh, to the CPI owner's equivalent rent, except it leads it. So I don't know why they lag the CPI owner's equivalent rent. I don't know why they don't just use these real rent indices, but this is sort of a headwind for those that think inflation's coming back by the middle of next year. I don't think so, because I think this effect is going to dominate. Uh, you know, of, of course, if you had an oil shock or something that would change the calculus, but all things being equal, that means lower. Here we have uh, another disinflationary, if not deflationary chart. Doesn't look like it, but if you think about the consequences of it, what we have here is the monthly mortgage payment on the median priced home. And over the past uh, couple of years, it's gone from about $1,000 to $2,300. That obviously is going to be a problem uh, for home buyers with these, with these rates where they are. And of course, they've come down a little bit, but that's, that's, this is through November. We had further mortgage rate declines in December. But this puts downward pressure on houses. These houses are just not affordable. And we can see that on the following slide, where we have the all-time lowest, going back to 19, late 80s, the all-time lowest housing affordability. And so we have another economic headwind. We don't have a lot of housing turnover. Pending home sales are very low. But there's one other deflationary force, if not simply disinflationary force, and that's homes under construction. And I'm really focusing on the yellow, orange shaded area, which is total multifamily units under construction. Look how many there are. Look how few there were versus total homes under construction back in uh, 12 years ago. And look how the single family homes under construction is actually dropping while multifamily homes has exploded. Uh, it's it, particularly back uh, two years ago, but these are gonna come on stream. And that means that rents are going to be under downward pressure. I even saw an article on the Newswire today. Uh, speaking of that, even though I put these slides together uh, over the weekend, I see that uh, that's starting to get traction. So there might be another reason why inflation is less of a problem than some traditional economists might believe. Here's U.S. core CPI X shelter inflation. So if shelter inflation was the same as uh, X shelter inflation, well, we'd be at a 2%, we'd be at a 2% core CPI. It's just the shelter component that has the core CPI uh, elevated above 2%. And I think that that's going to relax somewhat as I'm talking about. It's interesting that we're exactly 2.0 on core CPI X shelter. Also, one, one thing that's gotta have the Fed happy about how things are going is US break evens on comparing nominals to tips. I mean, we had a little bit of, gy of gyrations back in 2021, 2022, but it's completely calmed down for almost all of 2023. And from five years out to 30 years, the market pricing says it's expecting inflation at 2.2%. Ultimately, I think that's gonna be wrong because I think we're gonna run inflationary policies in response to the next recession. But this certainly gives a calming effect to market participants and no doubt the voting members on the Federal Reserve. Here's U.S. headline and core producer prices, another data point that's coming out uh, this week, producer prices, and there's nothing here after a huge increase uh, in 2022 of double digits on final demand and nearly double digits on X food and energy. We see it's come down to under 1% on final demand, and that should stay about the same uh, in the release this week. And the Fed's you know, Goldilocks case of 2% uh, on a year over. Here. So this inflation problem came and went. Uh, the Fed, I thought, was late to identify the inflation problem, and I think they over-tightened a little bit. Uh, I thought the last rate hike, maybe even the last two rate hikes, shouldn't have happened, and they're talking, interestingly now, they're sort of agreeing with me uh, tacitly because they're predicting that they're going to re reverse the last two rate hikes during 2024. I think they're going to cut more than that in response to a, a rougher economic patch. Now, the prices that I like the most, I talk about this every webcast that we talk about inflation, these are real prices. They're not seasonally adjusted. There's no adjustments to, you know, based on hedonics and stuff like that. Export and import prices are just prices. And they were out of control 
during the lockdown, but they've been negative now for several months. And we see export prices are down by 5.2 year over year and import prices are down 1.4. So real price indices are in deflation territory, import and export prices. So no worries there for the Fed. Commodities are weak. Commodities have been weak for the better part of 18 months, even coming on to nearly two years since they peaked, peaked out. And we have the red dotted line is the uh, 200 day moving average. And we've been living below the 200 day moving average really since the fourth quarter of 2022 with minor exception uh, in the third quarter of 2023. But we just can't seem to break above that 200 day moving average. This is further uh, corroboration of less than fully robust economic growth. And so we're now about five percentage points uh, below the uh, 200 day moving average and uh, not really getting any traction. Let's just look at two commodities, uh, crude oil, which has been incredibly uh, unchanged since the Ukraine situation broke out and then the Middle East problems um, more recently, uh, still basically near the low of the past couple of years. And uh, to my eye, we've got a lot of support here down at about 63 or so but if we break below that or break down through 60, it looks like oil could go a lot lower, which might be uh, the, the, the uh, plot for the first part of what I think is the coming recession before the inflationary policies uh, come in to try to deal with the uh, situation. Gold, uh, gold hasn't done anything in uh, nearly three years. I mean, sure, it had a meteoric rise in 2019 into 2020, uh, but then it, we've basically bumped into that top over and over again. Ultimately, I think gold's going to go higher. Uh, uh, in the near term, probably won't break above that. Uh, we still have my forecast of recession, but gold, I think, will ultimately go higher. Uh, the dollar will go lower and gold will go higher in response. I, I, I'm comfortable holding, holding gold at these levels. I do hold gold personally, although I've owned it for decades. Um, I just think that uh, it's probably not the path of least resistance to really break out in the near term, but uh, I just don't I just don't see a lot of downside here, uh, given given the uh, fiscal fiscal uh, and monetary setup that we have. All right, so let's go through the bond market and talk about uh, where opportunities and risks are. What we have here are yields in high quality, which means investment grade fixed income. So we've got investment grade, uh, basically between 5.7 and 5.4. When you go down to triple B, you know, obviously you should get a higher yield than, than a double A. And then we, we, there aren't really any triple A's to speak of in investment grade. I think there's like one. And so then we see uh, RMBS, residential mortgage securities. These are triple uh, A. These are non-guaranteed by the agencies. But these are pretty attractive at 550. Uh, there is no risk here. Home prices are very high. Default risk is utterly non-existent, given the uh, run-up in home prices over the past few years. Most people have tremendous equity in their homes. They're not going to default, and they have fixed-rate mortgages down at three percent, three and a quarter percent. So it's a really good asset to have to actually be. To, your, your mortgage is actually worth about 120 if you bought it if you if you borrowed down at three and a quarter. Then we see triple B non-QM. Maybe there's some risk there, so you're up at 7.1%. But this is a very good area to be getting meaningful yield, good real yields, without a lot of risk. CMBS, and it's a mixed bag. We've got the triple A's, which really should not take any defaults. So that's a pretty good yield uh, asset. And then we have the double B minuses. You might have a, a, a default or two. I think if you actively manage well, you shouldn't have any meaningful defaults whatsoever. And then they get down into conduit, a single A minus, and the market clearly is expecting defaults, and understandably so, uh, particularly in office uh, types of properties. And then we see asset-backed securities, which are very short term, uh, not no default risk, I don't think, in triple A's, so you don't get that much incremental yield, but the triple B's uh, can be safely purchased as well. Then we go into CLOs, which are floating rate assets that are uh, repackaged bank loans, um, those certainly the triple A's should not have any defaults. The double A's, uh, any competent management should not have defaults in double A uh, tranches of CLOs. Single A's, you might get a default or two, but here you're getting a floating rate asset uh, and you know it's it's you have no interest rate risk. Uh, 
and they're pretty solid credits. And then you go into uh, emerging markets and uh, emerging markets, uh, corporates, triple Bs are showing 6% uh, and, uh, so, and so forth. So these are, this is, this is the, the uh, investment grade categories of a market. Let's take a look at spreads. You'll notice that uh, corporates do not have the same spread as CMBS and CLOs, which are identical nearly at 150 basis points. So you have had a tremendous tightening you know, over the past two years in corporate AAAs. Uh, I guess this is that one AAA or so. Uh, and, and then we have very little tightening uh, during 2023. In fact, CMBS got wider over the course of 2023, and we see that uh, the, uh, the the CLOs actually did tighten in similar to corporates, but have a 110 basis point premium, which makes them a very attractive asset class. Then we see uh, agency mortgage-backed securities, and here we have the uh, the price of the index, which has rallied, but it's still down at 88.75 in that lower panel. So there is no prepayment risk. In fact, if you own these mortgages on average at a price of 88.75, defaults are your best friend. You'd wish you would get defaults. Unfortunately, you're not getting any as an agency mortgage holder because you'd be getting 88.75 partially paid back at 100, which is called a gain, which is something that we like. And so that is a very attractive uh, situation. The yield here uh, on the index is uh, 487. Uh, which is, you know, a, a, a reasonable spread uh, versus treasuries, particularly given that you really don't have that type of uh, problem with refinancing uh, with that you had over the last 40 years when you had systematically falling interest rates. So here's the agency mortgage spread. It definitely came in uh, to close 2023. It was all the way out at almost uh, 200 basis points. Uh, and now, and this is versus a blend of the five and 10-year treasury yield. And now we're down at 133, which given the price of the index, seems like a very good place to be in, in the bond market. Also, mortgage spreads should volatility come down, which could very well happen now that the Fed is talking about no interest rate increases and maybe even cutting rates. One would expect volatility might come down. And there's a very strong correlation between the mortgage spread and the interest rate implied volatility. It remains elevated in bonds, interest rate volatility, much more than it should be, in my opinion, with the VIX index having completely settled back down with all the retail euphoria in what I think is a rich, en rich enough stock market. You know, we still see elevated volatility on the bond side. That could relax. That would be a positive for relative performance of mortgage-related securities. Now, as decent as the mortgage index is, it's all pass-throughs. So its prepayment risk is, is wonkily termed ne negative convexity. So that yellow line, which is the, the uh, convexity of, of the pass-throughs, it was very negative, the yellow line. And since rates rose, and we've got all these discounts now in the mortgage market, there is no prepayment risk. And you see that with neutral convexity, which the, the higher the yellow line is, the, risk, the, the, the lower risk is in mortgage pass-throughs, and so it's quite low. But in the CMO market, which is an area for really professional investors, and we do a fair amount of that here at Double Line, you actually see that you can get longer dated uh, CMOs that actually have strong positive convexity. So you get all of that extra yield, but you also have a positive convexity. It means, it means that you have more upside than downside for a symmetric uh, interest rate movement. Okay, so let's go to below investment grade. And here we see, uh, below investment grade yields, and these are to no assumed defaults. So uh, high yield at 650, uh, it was a lot higher. We've had spreads tighten and yields on treasuries fall. Single Bs at 790, th these are areas that should not suffer substantial defaults, certainly not the double Bs. So you're getting a decent spread over treasuries. It's not as big as it was, but the, the, the risk doesn't seem to be that big. But as you go down to triple C's, the market clearly is assuming, and they should be assuming defaults, particularly if one wants to assume, as I do, a probability that's significant for a recession in 2024. Then you go to the bank loans. Double B's, very safe. I like double B bank loans. I've liked them uh, for a couple of years. Uh, single B's, a little bit of risk there, but I think you're compensated. The triple C's obviously are going to experience defaults. They show a 15.5 yield. And... These bank loans, you know, they 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 roll every 90 days. Uh, 
So all of these Fed's interest rate increases have been passed on to these borrowers. So these borrowers with higher interest rates uh, here, having gone on now for a while, they're getting, they're suffering. Their cash flows are really being curtailed by these higher interest rates. And now if the recession slows things down, um, maybe you'll get some bailout on the interest rate side, but certainly would expect uh, failures to increase. And so these are the yields in the, the uh, bank loan market. And then we see the CLO market, uh, triple Bs at 11.4, probably get some defaults there, uh, but they, the, 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 that's a pretty big cushion with an 11.4 versus you know 5% on short rates. And, and so on through the complex, uh, emerging markets at 7.5% for double Bs and 9.6 for single Bs, you a blend of those, you can get about 8.5%. That I think is attractive. Emerging markets had a rough uh, early part of 2023, but they sure finished strong, sure finished strong. And uh, I think that emerging market debt, once the dollar rolls over, will do well, it will outperform. And that's a place where we're gonna wanna be. Uh, triple C emerging market, you know, uh, obviously there's, there's risk there and that's compensated by a, a, a headline yield without defaults of 15.6. One thing about the bank loan market, which gives me uh, some confidence, is look at the maturity wall, what we call it. Now, of course, the interest rates have gone higher on a 90-day roll, but the maturity wall doesn't exist. Uh, as, of 2020, as of the end of 2022, there was about $80, uh, $80 billion of expected maturities, but those were all pushed out. Here in 2024, there's almost no maturities of bank loans, and the 2025s have been pushed out. So these these have been these 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 treasurers have managed it well. They've they've taken advantage of a market that was open, and they have uh, pushed their maturities out. So th they don't have to deal with maturities of any significance for the next couple of years. So that's that's good from a from a, a from a default protection standpoint. Now let's take a look at CLOs, which are repackaged bank loans. This is a fairly remarkable thing that's happened here, and that is that the pr these are prices. So we got the, the black line, which is triple A's, the red line, double A's, and so forth, down to the gold line, which is the double B's. And we'll, obviously these fell off a cliff during, during the lockdowns, but let's just take a look before COVID even showed up. So now we're at the end of 2019, the, the double B's are higher in price now than they were then. Uh, maybe that's because you know, the coupons are, are a lot better than they were then. Look at the, uh, in, in fact, when you go to the investment grade tranches, uh, the prices are higher today or about as high today as they were uh, in say the middle or later part of 2019. So it's, it's fairly amazing the incredible snapback. CLOs had a fantastic year last year, but they still seem somewhat reasonable. I just don't think uh, you, it's so much you can just, a year ago, you could just throw darts at the CLO market and you, you'd have hit, hit a bullseye. It's getting a little, little bit more selective. Uh, high yield defaults. Uh, well, based on lending standards, there's a, a belief that high yield defaults might go up. I think that'll take the recession, but recessions are tied into bank uh, lending standards tightening and they've clearly tightened. That's that yellow line. They've relaxed in most couple of months, but they're still elevated and it would correlate using history with a 0.59 R squared of an applied default rate of six and two thirds percent. Um, I think that that's higher than what one should expect absent a recession. I think that that's a, a reasonable expectation in a recessionary type of environment. Okay, so here's uh, the JP Morgan Emerging Market Index with spread to worse versus the dollar index. And uh, you maybe should have used the, the trade weighted dollar index, but the Dixie's on here. But we see that the spread is highly correlated to the movement in the dollar. So when the dollar uh, goes down, that's the, uh, that's the blue line. When it goes down, well, the spread on EM goes down. And certainly that's happened over the past couple of months. And it's happened with high correlation uh, going back over this five-year time period. Here's uh, the EM, the Emerging Market Index drawdown. This is fascinating because we saw the 30-year Treasury drawdown. That was so horrific, and it's still pretty horrific, uh, still down like 40, 44% or something. Uh, but the, the EM rally was pretty remarkable. See that at the end of the year, the EM index started out uh, maybe November or October with a drawdown from this, the peak back in 2021 or so, 
of 22%, well, it's now only about 12%. Now it's 135 I guess it got to around 12% uh, late, late in 2023. But that means it rallied by over 10%. So it just was gangbusters. And I like emerging markets. I would buy them uh, aggressively once we see the responses to the recession coming. Here's uh, CMBS, and this is going to be uh, the last section. And we see the triple B CMBS market is basically on its wides, uh, wider by a fair amount than it was entering 2023. I think there was some hope that things would calm down, but that didn't really happen with the regional bank problem in March. And we've instead rocketed higher on the triple B minus spreads. And we're out at 850 now, and there'll be some defaults there. And we say the triple A's have been very stable for a year uh, plus at 130. Uh, that's that, that's a good place to be. And what we see the intermediate part of the uh, capital structure, which is what we were really focusing on back around nine months ago or so, the middle part of the CMBS structure looked like it was baby thrown out with the bathwater, and we've seen some decent tightening there. I still think that the double, e, double A's are pretty safe. And I think depending upon uh, the way you approach it, you don't want an index approach. You, you want to underweight the danger parts of the market. Obviously, you know, urban centers, office office buildings where uh, cities where there's urban urban concentration and 50% vacancies in some of the towers, that's a problem. So uh, that th this is what's happened in CMBS. Now here's the prices. So very very different from the CLOs. This is CMBS prices of the indices by letter rating. So we see the triple Bs are up a little, but that's from absolute mega panic mode back in the second quarter of 2020. We're not up that much given how much other sectors in the stock market has rallied from that point. And then we see the single A's are still depressed, uh, still way lower than they were during the panic lockdown of 2020. This is that, that's the single A's. That's a, a, that is a fertile area for active management. So you don't want indexation, you want active management, and there's a lot of opportunity. And uh, we have, we have uh, been exploiting this uh, pretty well for the, for the past, uh, past year or so. And then we see the double A's, They've rallied all the way back to where they were at the end of 2022, so they've tightened in, and then the triple A's uh, ended up uh, tight, uh, going up in price, going up in price during uh, 2023. But here's the uh, real estate delinquencies. Commercial real estate loans hit the highest delinquency level uh, in in a decade. So you'll notice in 2022, it looked like it was getting better. It looked like the trend was relaxing. The bars were getting smaller, but that uh, reversed in the first quarter of 2023 and got way worse later on in the year. And so this is what's what's uh, hampering CMBS. So where do you find opportunities in fixed income? You've got to go where there is discount prices due to fear. And I think CMBS is one of those areas. So it's it's a mixed bag. So let's let's just take a look. This is this is the aggregated number and we see that this is significantly higher than where we were a year ago. But some categories are quite a bit better. The green line lodging has gone to a local low in delinquency. The uh, yellow line industrial never really had a problem. The uh, multifamily had a problem early in the lockdown and it's got down basically to the pre-lockdown levels. And then you see the problem areas, so-called other, but let's really just focus in on uh, basically re retail has gotten worse after uh, get getting somewhat better, but look at office. Office had no problems at all back in 2020. And 2023 was not a good year for office. That's what's really driving all of this, and it should continue to. So if you're investing in CMBS, what you should do is look at the various sectors that are owned. And if you're nervous, you would want to avoid funds that are heavily involved in office. And that uh, th those would be higher yielding, but I think the risk is palpable in those areas. So that's what I have for the Just Markets 2024 webcast live from Southern California in our office tower here in Los Angeles. I wanna welcome everybody to 2024. I hope you survived 2023. It turned out to be a lot better in 2022 for investors in both so in stocks in particular, but also in bonds uh, where the final part of the year really helped out. And so 2024, I think is going to be highly volatile. I think we're going to see a decline in interest rates in the first part of the year, followed by a recession, followed by a recessionary response, which may cause the need to rotate to lower duration bonds 
And this is going to be an active management year and we, we're, we're loaded for bear and ready to go. So good luck everybody with 2024, health and happiness and goodbye for now. Thank you for your support of Double Line.